Good morning. It is so good to see you in the Lord's house today. I want to welcome you to our services. We're so thankful that you chose uh, to come out and be a part of our services. Uh, we had a lot of requests, several requests, asking if we could have our business meeting this morning at the end of our service instead of tonight, so if there's no objection to that. That's what we'll do at the end of our service. Don't let me forget. Uh, we'll go ahead and have our business meeting. Um, I want to remind you that uh, next Next Sunday, uh, a week uh, from today, um, of course, we'll have regular uh, services at 9 o'clock that morning, but we'll have also a uh, drive-through wedding shower for Nathan Walker and Melanie Hayes, and then we'll have um, in our evening service, our worship service at 7 o'clock, we'll have a, um ordination service. We really encourage the church to come out for that and all of our ordained men to meet us at 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall for the ordination council and that'll be ordination service for Casey Hunt. Uh, do we have any other announcements we need to make this morning? We're so thankful. Yeah, okay. The directory? Yeah. Uh, it was postponed. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, uh, they wouldn't, it was, it was folks' phones. So we'll have to reschedule it when all this is over with. All right, any uh, other announcements or anything? All right, so thankful you're in the Lord's house here today. Uh, grateful to see each and every, every one of you. Chris Williams, would you lead us in opening prayer, please? everybody number six is how great thou art would you please turn to number six and let's sing the first third and fourth stanzas please
come at this time and do our special music.
Be the glory. Thank you so much, Whitney, for the beautiful message and song. Uh, if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to the um, book of Daniel. Got where we were at for a moment. The book of Daniel. We're in the, going to be in the fourth chapter today of the book of Daniel. <clears throat> the, the entire chapter is our text once again, but I'm, I'm just going to begin by reading verses uh, 4 and 5. We will probably look at several other scriptures, so I encourage you to keep your Bibles open and follow along with us when we do. But uh, the Bible tells us in verse number 4, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions <clears throat> of my head troubled me. Lord, we ask you to bless the reading of thy word, and not only the scripture that has been read and other scriptures that will be read, but we ask you to bless each word that is said. And Lord, remove distractions from our heart and mind. Let us be able to focus on what you would do in our midst today. We're just so happy to be in your house. And uh, Lord, I just thank you for the privilege we have. And for those that are that will be home listening, Lord, I just pray that you would let them feel a part of us and let us continue to feel uh, uh, to be a church family. And, and Lord, bless them. And let them have church right where they're at today. We ask all in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, this will be our last message in our series of messages uh, that we've been calling Sojourners because we're only here a little while, and we looked at uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were sojourners. They were taken from their homeland they were in a temporary land. Even though they were there a while, they were sojourners, and we also are sojourners. The question I want to ask uh, today is, is <clears throat> as we join God in, in building his kingdom in this temporary land that we are in, um, what is our biggest obstacle? What's the, what's the thing that gets in the way the most that prevents us from being successful for the kingdom of God and, and doing the things that God would have us to do? And I know you could probably list a lot of things. It's one of the top things that we would list if we were to take a survey. We would say Satan. Some of us would say self. But one thing that really hinders us, and I think one of the things that hindered Nebuchadnezzar uh, at this point, in, in, at this point we're reading about in his life was pride. Pride can be the biggest barrier. It can be the barrier that stops us in our tracks, and, and we just cannot be as successful for the kingdom of God because of pride. And Daniel chapter 4 is one of those great passages of Scripture that helps us understand pride. Looking at Nebuchadnezzar, uh, how he looked at things uh, and, and how, how proud he was uh, teaches us a, a lot. Uh, now, I, pride's a funny thing because I think there's a good kind of pride. I think it's okay to be proud of your parents, proud of your children in certain ways, proud of your church. But on the other hand, there's that pride that just focuses on self and all about self. It's got a focus on self. It likes to pat self on the back. Uh, uh, self gets all the credit. Uh, that's the kind of pride that the Bible speaks highly of. And, and, and a matter of fact, out of the things that God hates, uh, the first thing that listed, was listed is a, a proud look. Now, when you think about Nebuchadnezzar for a moment, you know, here's a guy that had a lot to be proud of when you really think about it. Uh, he had accomplished a lot. He was truly... Um, the ruler of the undisputed um, superpower of the world. I mean, that, that there was no one at this time, there was no nation as powerful as his nation. And, and, and he, he didn't inherit it. He didn't, he, he helped build it. He was a, he was a fighter. He, he led the armies and, and led, led them to victory after victory after victory and all over the world. And, and, and he, he built a massive empire. But he was also not only a military type guy, but he was a builder. He built uh, many things. He built many temples. Now, they were temples of Babylonian gods, uh, uh, but yet he, he was a great uh, builder. There was also the, the, the hanging garden, gardens of uh, Babylon. Um, 
that, that was one of the seventh uh, wonders of the world in the ancient world. Uh, it was built to be, I think it was 400 feet wide, uh, over 300 uh, feet tall. Uh, I, I researched some of that on the internet, just looking at the pictures of it and all that, and, and you know, of, of, of still some of the things there now. And it's just, just amazing. He also built a, a wall around their city that you could ride two char chariots. I mean, they could pass one another now that that's that's a big wall that gave him a sense of security and and, and he did that he he had he had many reasons to to be proud he was very successful but God did something in his life to, to at this point to bring change and and that's what we're going to look at today and his whole world basically just falls apart and at the end of it uh, he was glad it happened and you know that's, sometimes that's the way we are in the, in the middle of a mess we wonder you know it's like I don't want another tornado. I know nobody does. But, you know, on the when we were able to dedicate this building and come back to worship here as a group and uh, after being in exile at Colin for a while and South Fort doing all those things, it was such a great feeling. You know, and you almost, you, 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 you love the experience that we went through and the fellowship and everything we went through, we grew so much. But, but he was really, truly, I believe, happy at the end of this. Even though it was painful, it was hurtful, it was demoralizing, it was worth it because he got the, the spiritual poison, the, not, not godly spiritual, but this poison that he had within him out of his soul. So if we're going to be people that are called by God that, that, that understand pride, I think there's a lot we can learn here. And there's three scenes I want us to look at. First of all, uh, pride warps, pride destroys. The second thing will be God corrects, and the last thing will be humility restores. But first of all, let's think about pride, how it warps. Now, let me just summarize the first nine verses here of this chapter. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He gathered all his wise men together like he'd done in the past. Asked them to, he, he shared this dream with them, asked them to interpret it, and, and none of them could, so Daniel came in. And, and, and Daniel... Uh, he said, basically, Daniel, I know you're different than these guys. You, you, you know the holy God. And, and I want you to interpret this dream. So he, he starts in verse number 10, and he, he describes a dream. He talks about this tree that grew very tall, and it was very strong. And in verse 12, he talked about how fruitful and beneficial the tree uh, was. And, and then he talked about how he saw this, this head come down, uh, uh, come down from heaven and... and uh, then he goes in and, and beginning in verse number 14, we'll look there. It says, I have heard, um, I'm in chapter five, I'm sorry. All right, chapter 14, he said, I, I cried aloud. He cried aloud when, the, when he felt the Holy One come down. He cried aloud and, and, and he cut down the tree and the branches and he shook it. All the leaves came off and all the fruit was scattered and the beast all the animals that, that had thrived around this tree, they all fled away. And then he said in verse 16, his heart was changed and, and, and to, uh, uh, from a human heart to a beast, an animal heart. And he goes on to describe these things. But I want you to notice in verse 17, because we'll talk about this, the, about the middle of it, it says, gives a reason for it, to the intent that the living may know the most high rulest in the kingdom of men. And the most high God, that, we, that was the whole purpose of it, that never Nebuchadnezzar would know. Now, I believe that even if the wise men and the, all these individuals that he called in, I believe if they, if they knew the interpretation of the dream, I believe they were scared to say it. So they called Daniel in. And he knew Daniel could because Daniel, Daniel not only interpreted the dream, but he told him what his dream was. And so now Daniel comes in and Daniel, uh, he tells Daniel his dream and, and the Bible says it was about an hour. Daniel just, I don't think Daniel really wanted to tell him, but he had to build that courage up. And finally Nebuchadnezzar said, just tell me, Daniel, tell me, tell me what this dream is about. Share with me what, what, what this dream is is about. And then in verse, beginning in verse number 24 through 26, he begins to tell him what the dream's about. And then he said, here's the deal, King. <laughs> this dream is, is about you. 
And this dream says you're going to go nuts. This dream says you're going to lose your mind. You're going to live in the woods. You're going to, you're going to eat grass like the oxen do. And for, uh, it says seven times, that could be seven months, it could be seven years, but for a prolonged amount of time, you're going to experience anguish. You're going to experience a lot. And the purpose, as I said, is revealed in verse number 25 uh, till you come to the point where you know that God is God, that you know that the most high God is God. And it says that your kingdom at the end, your kingdom will be restored when you come to this point where you recognize that God is truly God. And he said, you're basically, he says, that you're going to go crazy. You're going to be insane. You're going to live like an animal. You're, you're going to come to a place uh, where, where you're just absolutely nuts and no one's going to be around you until you recognize that I am God. Now, why was that important? For Nebuchadnezzar to understand that. Well, first of all, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was in control. Now you think about what Nebuchadnezzar, how successful he was. How, how he had built so many things. He truly thought he was in control. He thought that everything that he had was because of him and that he was in control. And so he needed to know that he truly didn't call the shots. And until he did, he would never really connect with the true and the living God. And I believe there's a lot of people like that today that think they're in control and they, they just think well, they don't need God. We're living in a society today where people will look like and live like they don't, they don't need God. They, they don't have to have God. And, and, and I, I think about this and I think about how God kept pursuing Nebuchadnezzar. We've seen it in every chapter. And God would prove himself to Nebuchadnezzar. And, and I'm just like saying, come on. What's it going to take, Nebuchadnezzar? What's it going to take for you to recognize that God cares about you? God is true. He is a, a, a real God. What could possibly keep you from recognizing God? After, after all that's happened, after you've seen Daniel and Meshach, uh, Shadrach, and Abednego, when those three went to the fiery furnace, and Daniel interpreting dreams and standing up for God all, all this time, what, what could keep you from, from recognizing God? The same thing that keeps people from recognizing God today. Pride. Look what I'm doing. Look what I've done. And pride does it every time. Pride is powerful and pride warps our faith. It warps our view of things and we can get so caught up in self. But what God is saying, he says, I'm fixing to make it personal and I'm fixing to make it painful to get your attention. Do you realize God loves us enough to make life personal and painful to get our attention? Now, my friends, some people see that as punishment. But what God is doing, he's loving us. And it's a, it's a matter of, of, of true, real love. God is saying, I'm fixing to get your attention. Uh, and he, he basically says, uh, if you look to verse number uh, 28 uh, through 30, you'll see he says, and all these things came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, in other words, he had this interpretation of this dream given to him. Twelve months goes by. Nothing has happened. Daniel has said, you're going to be a madman. You're going to go nuts. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to eat grass you're like, like, like the oxen do. You're, you're not going to have anybody around you whatsoever. And now, so these twelve months uh, pass by, verse 29, and the end of twelve months, he walked into his palace of the kingdom of Babylon. Then verse 30 says, The king spake and said, Listen to him and hear the pride. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power? Do you, do you see these words? My friends, we, have to, we need to be very careful. We don't ever fall in this trap about, look what I have built. Whether it's a business, whether it's a home, whether it's a church, or what, whatever it may be. And he, he goes on to say, I built by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. 
Now, what takes place next is immediately everything that Daniel told him was going to happen begins to happen right then and there. In, in, in other words, he says, listen, I've done all this in my power and my glory and, 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 and this thing called pride, he made it all about himself. Here he was. He, 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 I'm successful. I've done this. I'm the one that's done this. And my friends, uh, so many times we get caught up in that. But pride is not only when we're successful. Pride can be gauged by a lot of other ways. And I want to just give you some statements. And I'll, use, I'll say I, but you put yourself there and see how you respond to these statements because we need to check our ego meter sometimes. It's not just when we're successful. It's much more than that. Pride affects us in many ways. I often compare myself with other people. That's one of the statements. You ask yourself, do you often compare yourself to other people? Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote that the, the, the assess of pride is competition. It, it, it's always competing with someone else. We have to be better than the other person. We, 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 we want to be more successful. It could be in sports. It could be in the way we look. Did I look nicer than they look today? Well, I think I do. Amen. It could be the, 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 our education. It could be our job. It could be how much money we have. But always comparing ourselves to others, always uh, looking at others and comparing ourselves to others. Here's another statement. I'll, I'll make it about myself. You make it about yourself. I find it hard to celebrate someone else's success, especially if they're doing what I'm doing, if they're in the same uh, profession that I am. Now, folks, listen, wouldn't that be sad that if I invited someone here to do a revival service, pray the Lord we can have one of those again real soon sometime, but you have that and they come in and do a fabulous job, people get saved. Wouldn't it be awful for the pastor or for a preacher, for somebody like myself, be to, to, to be upset about that and not be able to celebrate the success that we're having? Because it's not about the preacher's success. It's about God working through someone. It's not, and, and we get caught up in, in comparing ourselves not only to others, but, but having a hard time to celebrate someone else's success. I learned a long time ago, I, I had to deal with pride a long time ago. And anytime the people I went to school with, if I run across them, I'm always interested in what they're doing and I always tell them how proud I am of them. No matter what their success level is, but some of them have been very, very successful. Some of them have built great businesses and doing very well, doing um, just fantastic. And I'm so proud of them because it just blesses my heart because there was a time in my life I wanted to be better or equal. I had to get past that. And one of the things that you can look at to see whether or not pride is a problem in your life is whether or not you're always comparing yourself to others or if you have a hard time giving somebody a pat on the back because it's taking attention away from you and you want all the attention so you can't give them that pat on the back here's another one I'll use me again it bothers me when I'm ignored or not chosen you know the you know like you you're when we used to fellowship and stuff you know and you go into a place and nobody just runs to you and makes a big deal about you. Does that bother you? When you don't get picked for the, the play or the team or whatever it may be, does that bother you? It bothers most of us. But are you obsessed with it? That's pride. That's pride. Folks, listen. Some people, I know because I've had people call me before, well, I came in and nobody even, nobody just, nobody even greeted me. I said, you're there every week. You know, we got to make a big deal about you. We'll take your picture, put it on the screen. You know, what, 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 what is that? What, what if nobody says today, Brother Jay, good sermon? I don't understand that, basically. But, well, but nobody said, if I let that bother me each week, if, if I just listen to all the negative that's said and never focus and say nobody ever says anything good, I, I count it each week. I get two compliments every week, and I count them. Boy, I, that's what I count on, right? You 
then when you do get a compliment, here's the thing you'll hear me say, because it's something I learned a long time ago, to God be the glory, amen? Because I want to tell you this. This is, this is deep in my heart, because I had to deal with pride a long time ago. And I had to fight it back. Like, and anybody that says they don't, you're a little prideful, okay? Pride is something in us that makes us want to draw attention to ourselves. I, I need, no one need to hurry up. All right, here we go. All right, uh, it bothers me when I'm ignored or not chosen. Next statement, I make it about myself. When I fail, I get embarrassed. You know what I had to learn a long time ago because I'm going to make mistakes and, and a lot of times I'm standing in front of people? I just got to laugh. Well, we call it a Walmart moment. That's what I've always called it around here, right? I just got to laugh about it because I'm human. I mean, what, why get all embarrassed? Why get all upset? That's another sign of pride. And that's what I'm afraid people don't recognize. There are so many ways that we can be prideful. And if you're not careful, you'll fall into the trap. When someone points out a fault, do we get real defensive? And we start blaming every, everyone else. It wasn't me. It was somebody. It's never our fault. Never, I never say I'm sorry for anything. I could use Nancy Pelosi as an example for that. I guess, you know, uh, they set me up. They need to apologize to me. You know, just pass it on. Why not just take responsibility? Yeah, that was me. I thought nobody would see me, but I needed, I needed my, the gray was coming out, and I, I needed to get my hair colored. That's, what, that's where she went, right? Some of you ladies have done the same thing. You know, not that none of you have any gray coming out or anything like that. But look what happened to mine. You just come out and be, but no, you had to point it at somebody else. It was Donald Trump's fault. Donald Trump had that camera planted in that beauty salon. You know, that's just pride. I'm not saying she's a prideful person. Hmm. <clears throat> so pride is the problem. But God, God corrects because God cares. And, and, and what a wonderful thing. And, and beginning in verse number 33, and I, I'm going to try to, try to rush, hurry up here. But um, here, here we see that, that he gets in this place where he's as low as he's ever been. He's probably experiencing depression. He, he's uh, demoralized. There's no one around him. He's living like an, like an animal. His hair has done got so matted, it looks like eagle's wings. His, his fingernails, the Bible tells us, looks like uh, bird claws. I mean, he's in, he's in a bad, bad place. And he, he, he literally has gone nuts. He's truly lost it. He's in a terrible place. And God's hand of discipline is upon him because God wants to correct him and bring him back. And so what, what happens as he, as he gets to this place? God begins to correct him. Here it is. Now, some of you have been in, in, in places in life and you think, why is this happening to me? And I want to tell you why some things happen. Sometimes God is trying to break our pride. And the only way he can do it sometimes is to allow some things to happen to us to get us to look up. God will do some, sometimes he will remove something of value from us. We will, something that, is, that we put a lot of trust in or faith in or hope in, but it's very valuable to us. Or maybe he'll remove our influence. He'll knock us down a notch. He'll just allow us to stumble and, and, and fall and, and not give us that protection to, to remove that influence that we once had just where we will see how prideful we are and how uh, we focus on self so much. Sometimes he will remove those things that we prop up on, those things that we're always just propping up for and, and against that, 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 that hold us up. He may move that to allow us to fall where we will get to a place where we look up. See, God has a way of correcting each and every one of us, and he's unique in each and every one of us. Um, he may correct me in a way that he may not correct Kenny or Tim or, or Donald, he, but, it, but he may correct correct them in a way that he doesn't correct me. God's correction 
He knows us so well, he uses his method of correction to correct us as an individual. You see, I told you in the beginning, the reason God was doing it, because he wanted him to see God and recognize God as sovereign. But, but the thing, my friend, is I would also told you that he was going to make it personal. And God makes his correction personal for each and every one of us, especially if we belong to him. And, and he makes it personal, directed towards us, right at us, and it's also painful. But the last thing is simply this. Humility restores. And these are the verses I, I really want to want to focus in on and, and close. In verse, beginning in verse number 34, we'll just kind of look over them. At the end of these days, Nebuchadnezzar did what he do? He lifted up his eyes. He lifted up his eyes. Where to? To heaven. He lifted up his eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, he says. And, 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 and he goes on to talk about how he began to praise God, how he began to focus on God, how he began to recognize God as the most high. I praised him. I honored him. He liveth forever. His dominion is ever everlasting. His kingdom is from generation to generation. He goes to this point where he now looks up to God. He had been broken. He had been corrected. God had used this unique way to correct him, to get him to a place to say, listen, yes, you have been a successful person, but it's not by your strength. It's by my grace that you become so successful that you've done all these things. And I, I, have, I have knocked you down where you can look and you can recognize there's only one true and living God. And so here he's, he's knocked down to this point. And my friends, uh, he doesn't call. Have you noticed up until this point, he always talked about Daniel's God. Nebuchadnezzar's God, not Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego's God. He never talked about God being the most high. But now, see, I said God was going to make it personal. It got personal. It's no longer Daniel's God. It's his God. I ask you today, who is God to you? Is it your God or my God? Or you say, well, I, I think I might like Brother Jay's God. Listen, it needs to be your God. God went to the cross. He sent his son Jesus to die for you personally. It's got to become personal, and it becomes personal right here for Nebuchadnezzar. It gets personal. He's calling them out. He's saying, this is my God. This is my God now. The most high God. He recognizes him. He is the most high God. There is no God above this God. None whatsoever. There are a couple of things I, that I think that I take from this. This entire chapter, first of all, I want to say this. No one is beyond reach of God's grace. Nebuchadnezzar looked like a lost cause. When I read through the book of Daniel, I look at Nebuchadnezzar, and, and I see in, in chapter 1, it says, man, God's trying to get your attention. I see it in chapter 2. I see it in chapter 3, and again in chapter three and 4. He gets his attention. He, he would talk about, boy, Daniel's God. He's a good God. Everybody needs to say something good about Daniel's God. But now he's been changed. He says, the most high God. Friends, listen, I don't know who you may know. I know there's some people I, I, that, that I have just had to knock the dust off my feet and, 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 and walk away from. But they're not out of reach. God can reach them. God can speak to them. God can change them. If God can change Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he can change us. And I want you to understand something about our culture today, okay? I, sh I shared with you early on in this series that most uh, followers of, of, of culture says that we're not, in a, we're, we're not considered to be a Christian nation anymore. We're a post-Christian nation. Now, that doesn't say there's no Christians here. It's just the Christian influence in government and in, in schools and all that thing, it's not there anymore. It's not like it once was. I don't want to give a lesson on that, but I think, if, if, I hope you know what I'm talking about. Christian influence is, is, is people, for when Billy Graham was alive, he'd get up and say something in the 60s. People listened. Franklin can say something now, and I pray to God people will listen, but it does not influence what the Congress is going to do or the state governments or the local governments. The churches don't have that influence like they once did. I could give example after example after example over that. But my friends, so the thing is, 
we're going to recognize and we're going to see more people that don't recognize God that think they are self-sufficient and they're sovereign. We need to realize that God was working on Nebuchadnezzar chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and then chapter 4. The whole time here, God was dealing with him. God, God was doing something. And you know what God is asking? He's asking us to join alongside. So when we see that person who does not honor God, who does not look to God, who will not call upon God. We need to know that God's working anyway, and we need to look for opportunities to join alongside of Him and work in these areas. God is still at work, and there's no one beyond the reach of God's grace. The second big takeaway I want to talk about, as sojourners, let's carry on the mission of Jesus in a Jesus-like way. Let's do it Jesus' way. We, we get focused on too many people. We need to get back focused on Jesus. Jesus did everything by lovingly telling the truth, ministering to people who didn't deserve it, doing things for, for, for individuals. Jesus it was a minister while he was on this earth. Now, the Bible tells us that he was equal to God, but he did not take that, that equality. He, he laid it down to take on the form of a servant. That's what Jesus did. Jesus came to serve. He came to seek and save the lost, but he came and he showed humility and servanthood the whole time that he was here. He carried out his work with humility and we need to do the same thing. And my friends, there's too much pride sometimes within our churches for us to do that. Jesus was God, but yet he laid all that down and that's our model. He is our model. We need to always, I've said it a hundred thousand times, I bet, since I've been in the ministry, we we need to always be in the Gospels because we need to always be learning about Jesus and we need to take the example that Jesus said and live it out in this world and in this society. We need to recognize that during this post-Christian uh, culture that we, that we live in, that God has placed us right here. He wants us to be a part of His work and He has not stopped working even with all the, uh, the, the vandalizing, even with all the rioting, even with all the businesses being burnt in our nation today, even with all the hatred and with all the division, even with a pandemic, even with people uh, uh, putting others down all the time, God hadn't stopped working. My friends, we may not be doing all that we normally would do in teaching and all the different things that we've done in church before, but God is still at work. God didn't slow down because of a pandemic, and God is at work. He worked in Nebuchadnezzar's life. He worked in Nebuchadnezzar's life, and He's working in the lives of the wicked. What we think is wicked, He's working in the lives of individuals that may feel like they're self-deficient, but God is there. And you know what happens? In a lot of cases, God will take a prop away from them and they will fall down and the Christians say, oh, God's giving them what they deserve. And what God wants to do, He wants to say, Aaron, go help them. I put you here to help that person instead of making fun of them, instead of putting them down, instead of running them down. God has put the church here to go out when that prop is knocked away, when something valuable is taken away, when they're hurting and they're suffering. He's saying, church, go out, go out, go out. I'm working in their life and I'm going to use you as a tool and an agent. My friends, I'll tell you, I want to preach a message on Wednesday night not long ago about standing in the gap. And I want to tell you, there's too many standing in the way and we need to stand in the gap for the kingdom of God. So I ask you today, are you standing in the gap or are you standing in the way to ministering to people in our community, in our church, and those that are hurting? Everyone is reachable if Nebuchadnezzar was reachable. And you and I are going to be the tools to help them to come to know Christ Jesus. Father, have your way in our midst today. I thank you for the privilege and honor to preach your precious and holy word. And I ask you, Lord, to move in our midst. Allow us to move according to your will and according to your way. Uh, let us recognize that those that we've given up on, you've not given up on. And those that we may think are too prideful to be broken, that you can meet them personally, sometimes painfully. But Lord, humility can restore them through Jesus Christ. 
And we pray this prayer in his name. Amen. One other go same, brother. 542, Lord be glorified. All who will stand. Sing God all three stanzas, please.